Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final panel of today. I am pretty excited about this. I hope you all are too. Uh, for everyone in the audience, please do let us know where you're joining from. Let us know if there's anything that you want us to talk about in this next session. I see. Oh, and <laughs> Mr. saying, no, not the final panel. Sorry. We, there's, a, there's a bonus sort of after party session with uh, Joe, our CEO, uh, uh, later on after this. But this is going to be good. Uh, I'm. Yeah, I enjoy all our sessions, but we got four speakers rather than three for you. So it's going to be an extra exciting discussion. So uh, let's see who we got. Uh, the chat scrolling very fast. I have to pause this. Um, okay. Uh, we got Anna from Canada. We've got uh, Mark from Philadelphia. We've got Awanish from India. We've got Carolina from Toronto. Noah from Florida. Uh, oh, I should go too fast. Too many people here. Uh, Andrea from Bogota. We got Gustavo from Washington. And we got Adam from Romania. Um, all sorts of people here. I'm very, very excited by the global audience. Well done for everyone uh, joining from around the world. I know some of you in pretty weird time zones for this. Uh, so very late for you or very early. Glad you all made it. All right. So with that, I think it's time that we got started. So over the last few years, a lot of organizations have been getting really excited about generative AI and they've been building things that they're thinking to solve all of their problems. And then they discover that actually the AI is generating garbage. Um, and so when they dig deeper, they discover the old truth that AI is only as good as the data that you feed into it and that their data quality control is non existent. So on a personal level, as a data scientist, I've had way too many experiences where I've been like, I've had to present my results and then say, well, I know my analysis is technically, re technically correct, but I really don't believe the results of my own work because the data set was pretty sketchy to begin with. And this is a terrible experience, both like the data scientist and the audience, like no one wants to be like, well, this is analysis this is nonsense, we've just been wasting our time. So uh today we're going to learn about how to improve data quality and more generally data governance across an organization and so for this uh last panel session we got four of the finest minds in the data governance space so first uh stefan verhulst is the chief research and development officer and the director of the data program at nyu governance lab he's also a co-founder and principal scientific advisor at the data tank and a senior advisor at Markle Foundation. Esther Muni is the chief data officer at SASFIN. She was recognized as the CDO of the year in 2023 at the Finovex South Africa Awards. And she was also on the list of uh, global data power women in 2023. Amy Grace is the director of military engines digital strategy at Pratt & Whitney. She spent much of the last few decades running teams working on analytics for predicting the health of aircraft engines. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, and this is uh, something that's got pretty terrible consequences if you get your data wrong, so she's no stranger to worrying about data governance. And rounding out our fierce and foursome is uh, Mala Virapan, uh, a program manager and senior data scientist at the World Bank. She was part of the task team that launched the World Bank's Open Data Initiative and was instrumental in creating the World Bank's first data council. So uh, four real experts here. And uh, with that, let's learn about how to improve our data governance. So um, I think it's worth just defining what we're talking about here. So uh, can you explain what you mean by data quality and what are the business impacts of having better data quality? So uh, Esther, do you want to go first on this? Sure. Um, thank you, Richie. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, so what is data quality? Data quality is really about having the right data that you need in the right format and ready for use for purpose at the right time. Um, I use the analogy of data is like data quality is like baking a cake. You know, you, you need to have the right ingredients. It needs to be in the right amounts. It needs to be available. And I mean, if you're baking a cake and the baking powder or the sugar is missing or you don't have the right quantity, then the cake will most likely not come out right. So it's, it's really about, you know, 
the, the, having data that is accurate, relevant, complete, and consistent. And you know, striving for better data quality means that business leaders are able to make better decisions. Because the reality is if you base a decision on faulty data, you will most likely make the wrong calls, which can cost the organization. Um, and also having better data quality improves the client experience. And by improving the client experience, you can increase revenues. Um, I work for a bank, and one of the things that we put a lot of effort in is improving the quality of our client data. And in order to achieve one of our strategic objectives of client of being client centric, is we must first understand our clients, and we want to understand their their behaviors. But to do that, we need to study and and and, and explore and understand the data that we have around our clients. And the one thing we've also realized is that, you know, um, clients can get very frustrated when we have the wrong information um, of them. I'm sure most of us are, have, are banking um, with, with an organization or a financial institution. And I'm sure you get frustrated if they have their own information, like the wrong name, or they send you um, a birthday message on the wrong date, or they send you communication and you don't receive it because they have the wrong address. So it's important to always have the right information when it comes to clients. And I think that other thing is, is, is it's important to have good data quality um, so that you don't miss opportunities, um, you know, by perhaps not seeing the chances and opportunity to gain more customers and to improve your product offering. Um, and that is really around being, getting, um, you know, having a competitive advantage. And um, so if, if you don't have the right data and the data is not correct, you're not able to, to explore those, those opportunities. I really like that analogy of uh, it being like uh, a cake and you mess up the, uh, the proportions of the ingredients and yeah, it's going to be uh, a disgusting mess rather than uh, something edible. Um, all right. So I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, wow, I really love the quality of data at my company. So, um, why does data quality never seem to be a solved problem? Um, Stefan, do you want to go first on this? Yes, thanks, uh, Richie, and a pleasure to be on this panel, this great panel here, uh, focusing on data governance and data quality. And as it relates to your question, I think there are a variety of reasons why data quality is never really uh, an objective that is always uh, or ever uh, fully met. And, and I think the first one is really about kind of the dynamic nature uh, of data itself. Data is not a static kind of thing. It uh, evolves. And especially, I would say, in the current environment where we have moved to new kinds of instrumentation of collecting data, especially the data that has some kind of a real-time quality, there is more opportunity also to really um, have challenges with some of the data that might not be fully captured or might not be fully um, uh, qualitative as well. And that also relates to then the dynamic context in which data is being collected, which also means if the context changes, of course, the quality might change, or the expectations and the requirements, as uh, uh, Esther was saying, if the cake changes, then the expectations and the requirements for the cake and the ingredients uh, might change as well. And that is especially the case when you start reusing data that was collected for one purpose for another purpose, and then you have different kinds of requirements, that also means that the quality requirements might be different and as a result, never being seen uh, perfect. The other reason uh, is actually that indeed, data is not static, but also it's not a thing that uh, is uh, not a, a result of a process. And so data typically uh, evolves during the data life cycle. And uh, at every point of the data lifecycle, there are opportunities to improve or to decline uh, the quality of the data as well. And I think that's why data governance really and data quality uh, really needs to do, take an end-to-end -end kind of approach when, anyway, from when you start creating or collecting data to ultimately when you start using uh, the data uh, and the insights that is generated from the data, there is a quality uh, component to every step of the data life cycle. And so that also means that um, given the fact that it's dynamic, given the fact that it's also uh, the result of decisions made across uh, the data life cycle, 
means that we not just have to look at data quality from a policy perspective, but really from a cultural perspective, because I've been advocating on many occasions that right, data quality is actually the result of a culture of data quality that exists within uh, an organization or within a corporation for that matter. And that really it has to be about a cultural shift towards making sure that data is qualitative, it's not dirty or faulty for that matter. And that's really what uh, matters. And then the other shift from my point of view is that we really need to start thinking about data stewardship and how we actually steward data in a way that is aligned with the purpose. Uh, and that is also then uh, aligned with the requirements that are needed uh, from a quality perspective. So a long-winded answer to your question, Richie, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's of course because a complex matter and uh, data quality is the result of many decisions, not just one at the point of collection. Okay, uh, I like the idea that um, this uh, cake that we're making here might want to change over time. You are on different cakes uh, on different occasions. Um, but yeah, uh, it seems like you need that kind of broader idea of data governance and data stewardship if you want data quality. Um, Amy, do you want to add to this? Like, do you have any ideas on like um, how um, how data governance is feeding into this and in, into um, like the the idea of uh, data quality staying good over time or getting better over time? Yeah, I I agree with everything Stefan says. In addition, I just think it, a lot of us are data consumers, and we don't always know where the data comes from or who the real producers are of the data that we pick up in different places. And I think we also kind of have a tools first mentality. We usually express um, our needs in the way of the data we want to see. So a lot of times we end up with uh, people making local tools to aggregate data and look at it the way they want to, but all of the aggregations and everything are really happening behind the scenes of what they're looking at. And I think a lot of times just the visibility across the enterprise of who has what data and what data is available has been a challenge. So I, I do think that some of the, the technologies are helping us to be more aware and, and concepts like cataloging, um, I, I think are really important just to make people aware of the data behind the dashboards. Um, I, I also think that um, we're learning uh, to evolve our, our requests of data to be more in the form of questions we want answered and you know maybe the generative ai culture is helping us to be as we get experience it's a lot of what you get is how you frame the questions and uh i, I think that's been helping us to get better at framing the questions we want to answer to support the decisions we need to make and the actions we need to take and if then you consider what data do i need to be able to make those decisions um, I think we're all evolving in our awareness of the data beyond the dashboard culture. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, mean, I do like the idea that uh, if you're just consuming data, like you're looking at a, a dashboard, you should have an understanding of what the data is underneath the, the pretty visuals. Uh, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it seems like uh, maybe we need to have some um, areas of innovation here. So. Uh, uh, Mala, can you talk me through like what are the main areas organizations need to innovate in terms of data governance? Thanks, Richie, and hello to everyone. I really like all these flying hearts and smileys. It's uh, it's super nice, and also the many many pictures of cakes. Uh, it's quite distracting, <laughs> I have to say. But <laughs> but uh, thanks for the question, um, Richie. I mean, I want to kind of take a step back a little bit uh, to just sort of paint the picture of you know data governance happens at different levels. Uh, you know, at an organizational level, it happens at the national level, uh, you know, at the, the country uh, at the highest level, it, it happens at the international level, because data now flows, uh, you know, it's, it's not that data is just used by only a few people or by a few communities or organizations. Data is now, everyone uses data, everyone generates data, everyone uses data actively or passively. So the first thing I think we really have to change the way we're thinking about data governance uh, is that it? It is it. It must involve all stakeholders. Uh, you know, whether governments who are using data to improve services or policies, private sector who are creating new innovative, uh, you know, products out of the data that they have, uh, or opening new markets, uh, or uh, you know, just individuals in civil societies who can really use the data more effectively to hold 
governments, private sector accountable. Um, so, you know, with th this sort of, uh, you know, interventions that are going to happen at different levels across multiple stakeholders, maybe I will focus on four or five areas where we think we really need to innovate in data governance. Uh, the first, I think, is really shifting the mindset of uh, collecting, generating data to really use and reuse of data. You know, I don't want to get into this debate on how much data that is being generated. I mean, I think we've lost count now, zettabytes and whatever new terms we're using, but there is a lot of data. Granted, there are gaps, of course, but there's also lots of data. Uh, and the question to ask is whether we're using that data effectively. Are we enabling flows of that data across different stakeholders? Uh, are we putting in standards to improve the interoperability of all of, all of this information? So really shifting that mind, mindset towards uh, use and reuse, I think, is really critical. Uh, and then the second is about to stop. I mean, I don't know how many people from the technology team are here, and, and I'm not saying this in a sort of negative manner, but really looking at data governance is, is not as a technology initiative. Because the first thing when somebody says, I'm thinking about data, is, is a tool that manifests in their mind. Uh, I think now data governance goes beyond creating a technology product. I want to give an example in Kenya where Kenya is doing, by the way, many great things, but this is just uh, based off of a study uh, that they did. And, and, and this is kind of the situation in many countries, uh, you know, where in Kenya, particularly this study where they found in 58 hospitals, they had um, across different ho hospitals, they found 58 different applications that was collecting data on different diseases, on different, uh, different type of health services that was provided, and none of them talked to each other. So you want to put this scenario in your mind. You know, all of us go to the hospital, right? I, I speak about health because I'm I'm currently working in the health sector. So maybe many of my examples are going to be there. But you go to a doctor, you know, they, they take your vitals. That's recorded somewhere. You may have some kind of, a, you know, accident. You fall, you go to radiology, you get a scan. You know, all of this information is getting recorded. The question to ask is, is that being used actively? Is that being used? Uh, is, is that information being uh, connected? And for, for all of that to happen, you can't think of this as a technology issue. Uh, the data governance needs to sit outside of a technology initiative where we're really focusing on new rules of how all of this new data that's emerging can talk to each other. Um, you know, what kind of skills and workforce you need. Uh, you know, Stefan talked about people. I think the people dimension is really key here. Do you have people who are setting standards, new rules of the game? Do you have regulators who are thinking about the broader implications of regulations of protecting information? Because some of the information we're talking about are really, really uh, personal data and uh, important to protect. So the, the point being there is, yeah, thinking beyond uh, this as being an IT tool. Uh, and then, of course, creating a balance of, uh, you know, reforms, which is enabling use, but also really important to safeguard information really protecting, really thinking about cybersecurity, data protection, some of the things that are, you know, quite boring and, and people don't really often talk about talk about those things. Um, and uh, having this, uh, having having a really good leadership, uh, which is, really creates that uh, uh, a culture of data use, because often leadership teams fail to visualize the tangible benefits from data governance. Uh, I think it's important to advocate for that and create that culture of data use and incentives for for people to use uh, data more actively. A lot to think about there. I think the tricky part is like you say, nothing is connected. Your colleagues need to talk to people, talking to people in other teams. That sounds very dangerous to me. Uh, okay, so uh, there's a lot to do. I think we need to get into like getting started, but before that, I, I want some motivation. Um, so let's talk about some success stories. I'd like to know if there are any examples of organizations where they've made an effort to improve their data governance and then they've seen some real benefit from it. Um, Esther, do you want to talk us through some examples? Absolutely. Um, so, so obviously, I work for a bank and I mentioned that earlier. And one of the things that, that tends to happen to banks is that we are under stringent regulatory requirements, which demands that we meet certain regulations and legislations and and part of it is ensuring that you have proper governance over over your data but i think the 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 thing that tends to happen is that is that data governance tends to be seen as this oversight function that's that's there to come with you know sort of like 
you know, a stick to come and see that everybody's doing what they need to be doing instead of seeing it as something that's an enabler or a strategic driver for the business. Um, so one of the things I can say that for us was a success story was shifting that 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 view and that notion that one that data is is, an, is owned by IT. It's not owned by IT. It's owned by business. Um, that that shift really created um, the, the 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 idea of accountability, responsibility, and also the the by owning the data. From a business perspective, it means that they can leverage it. I love a saying, um, I forget the person that said it, but you know, when it comes to data management and, and adopting to data analytics, it's it's there's there needs to be an element of change management. And um, the idea that you know for business that they own the data that's sitting in a system somewhere is is very difficult to fathom and, and, and to decipher. But through the process of change management, um, and, and the, back to the quotes that I wanted to say is, somebody said, change is a threat when done to you, but it's an opportunity when done by you. Um, I forget the person that said that, but it's about taking people through the journey and let it, let, letting the business users understand why um, you know, um, having governance over their data is important. So that's that's a huge, I think, plus for us. The second thing is the, the the idea that not all data is equal. You know, there's this idea that you need to go and govern all the data, and that's not necessarily true because some data um, that you might have or data elements that you might have in your organization is actually not useful or fit for for purpose. It's it's really it could just be unusable really. Um, so it's about identifying what are those key data elements that you need to focus on? What are your crown jewels? And then focus on that. So one of the things we've done with data quality is create that, that roadmap around what data should we be overseeing, what data should we be managing, and what data should we be monitoring and maintaining from a data quality perspective. The other thing around when we talk about not all data is equal is also true to data quality, right? If you take the example of the cake, um, you might have a scenario where you put in a little bit of sugar, not enough, but it's still edible, right? But if you do not put any baking powder or you do not put any flour into the cake, it's unedible. It's, it's, it's not useful. So what we've done is we've also realized that there's a level of tolerance around, around data quality. And that's what we've, uh, we've applied in our data quality framework where we've tried to understand based on the different data quality rules and data quality metrics, what is the tolerance for the business? Because that way, we, when business is making decisions based on a certain tolerance levels, they know that um, when they make that decision, it's based on, on a certain standard, which they've defined. Um, the other thing that um, I think that has been very successful is realizing that the, the human element around uh, around governance is is of often overlooked. Um, we tend to, to stick to the technology, to the data itself, but not really looking at the people aspect. Um, so we've we've really also started to shift that 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 and frame the way we. We, we look at data governance, but focusing on the people. And that means ensuring that the data affluency or data literacy of key people is elevated in order to improve our data quality and to ensure that data governance is, is embedded in a way that's useful for our business. A um, lot to think about there. I like the idea that um, you need to decide which things uh, are the most important, which, which data sets are the most important and like what your tolerance for quality is um, for those. Um, because there's a lot to go on, I'm trying to work out what's the first step. Uh, Amy, do you want to talk through like how you like when you're right at the start? How do you begin improving your data quality? So I think some of the um, most important first steps is to have a burning platform. There has to be you know, you know a need for change. People have to say this can't go on um, because their experience with the data is just not working. Uh, another thing. In a, in a company is that's invaluable is to have strong executive championship. To, to, there's not, no support to having a courageous leader at the top who will empower people who want to change. 
Um, I think another thing that's important is to have a data governance professional. So somebody who can help teach us the ins and outs of data governance. Um, I also think it's equally important to have case studies that'll help to teach the, the people in the workforce, especially the executives that are going to have to drive some of these things down through the organization, case studies that'll teach them um, why we should care about data governance and what the consequence is uh, and how it's holding us back. And then lastly, we, we when we started our uh, data governance council, um, I think somebody else mentioned the importance of change management. We actually have a change management specialist working side by side with our data governance um, lead. And the most important part of this are um, engaged, committed, forward thinking business partners. Uh, because like Esther says, they own the data or they, they are most intimately familiar with the data. We're asking them to take on new roles and um, to have those people come and be, you know, committed as opposed to just compliant um, is is the key, I think, to to um, really take off and, and start our journey. Um, I like that. And you mentioned there should be um, some sort of executive um, leadership uh, involved in this. Um, maybe we should talk a bit more about like which teams and which roles uh, need to be involved in any sort of data governance program. Uh, Mala, do you want to take this? Sure, Richie. So um, I often, um, you know, say that we want to think about it more in terms of the functions because each organization creates its own team or uh, I guess the role remains the same, but it's often difficult to create new teams, depends on the fiscal constraints of the organization, again, at different levels, at the national level or at an organizational level. But importantly, I think Amy uh, touched upon some of those roles already uh, in terms of and I think Esther also in the sense that having first the data governance, having that sort of leadership from the top is important. You kind of need both. You don't want it to be a very compliance oriented sort of tone that you set for data governance. So you have a leadership that really that really shows that this is beneficial for everyone and you're kind of recruiting everybody to this agenda. So and you so you need that executive sort of committee that is uh, sort of owning this uh, so it's sustainable in the longer run. Then you have to have different, um, also dedicated roles for people who are going to be framing standards uh, around uh, for data governance. You need business uh, domain experts who understands the data and actually, so it's not data for data's sake, but really how at the end of the day, how are you going to use that data to improve any, any type of business in, uh, outcome? Uh, you know, it could be from the government side, improving policies or reducing poverty or, uh, you know, providing better services from a private sector perspective, it could be improving their own business outcomes. Uh, so even from an individual's point of view, if you had access to your own health record, you can take better decisions, for example, or on your health or on your financial outcomes. Um, so it's it's about um, really having those business domain experts as part of as part of the committee. Uh, I mean, I think Stefan uh, already talked about this new sets of roles that are getting created in organizations called data stewards, whose role is really to look um, at data and see how the data can be used in the organization, how data can flow across different departments. Often, you know, you have siloed use of the data, you know, data from, say, a finance department is not really being used. It could be used for some other purpose that's, you know, it would be the responsibility of the data steward. And, and um, another group of people is the legal team in an organization or regulators or data protection officials at the, at the national level who are deciding on these regulations and policies uh, that is really standardized. Um, I know we all like, love lawyers, but as much as we love them, I think it's really important to still engage them um, uh, and sort of really bring them along as well because they, they have like Esther said, sometimes you really have strong compliance requirements, but I think somewhere you have to see that, see the balance to see how you can bring them along to be able to use this data efficiently. And then, of course, people who are really looking at measurement and uh, very technical uh, issues like anonymization of data. That is still, a, a, you know, some of these areas are still being explored now that we're bringing in very many different types of information like geospatial, cell phone records, 
So having a team that's technically aware of how you bring some of these anonymization techniques or data integration techniques uh, and continuously thinking about that in a systematic manner is, is also important. This is interesting because I was kind of expecting the answer, okay, we've got executives, we've got the kind of technical data people, we've got business people, but it's actually, it goes beyond that because you need like legal people as well. And then even like people outside your organization, like uh, governments creating regulations. So it's a, it's a very much a, a team effort there. All right. So I feel like a lot of the ideas around data governance are going to be the same from one organization to the next. And you shouldn't be having to reinvent the wheel from scratch. So are there any principles or frameworks around data governance uh, that you can leverage? Um, Stefan, do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. And and again, I mean, this is a, a wonderful panel, and and so uh, and also, by the way, a wonderful chat. I Meaning, it's a great uh, set of uh, uh, lessons even learned from just looking at the uh, the chat. And so, I'm not sure how much I have to add here, but one of the frameworks that we have developed um, in order to really kind of demystifying um, data governance is uh, something what I call the five P's uh, of data governance, which really is about uh, purposes, principles, uh, processes, um, uh, practices, and positions. And, uh, and I think we have discussed a few of them already, because to a large extent, from my point of view, data governance is actually a set of practices, positions, and processes to meet a purpose that is aligned with a set of principles. And I think if you think in terms of those kinds of five P's, then you basically have kind of all the ingredients for the cake that uh, uh, Esther has been uh, baking here. Um, um, and it also means that we really have to, A, be crystal clear. And it goes back to your question, uh, Richie, on where, do, where would you start? And I always anyway, recommend organizations uh, or uh, anyone who wants to develop a data governance uh, structure to really start with the purpose, because that's really where uh, uh, it all uh, comes down to. Because otherwise, why do you need governance if you have no purpose that you seek to establish or meet? And so a key, crystal clear purpose. But then in order to achieve that purpose, you will have to make decisions. And so then it's going to be very important to have a set of principles that will align those uh, decisions uh, um, in a way that meets the purpose, but that it's also principle based. And so here, of course, I'm not going to go into the full fledged uh, kind of set of principles that you can apply. And there are, of course, well established principles such as the fair information practice principles which anyway were developed 30 years ago but are still anyway some of them are still pretty sound and uh, uh and actually should be uh, uh retained uh, but you also have a set of new principles from my point of view that have entered the space one of them is actually equity and inclusion which i think uh, needs to be uh, uh more included in data governance meaning that anyway how do you make sure that the data benefits everyone uh, to a large extent in a way that is also inclusive? But also uh, the principle that we have worked on, which is kind of digital self-determination, which is, of course, specifically uh, more relevant for um, personal data, where uh, at, at the same time, you not just rely on consent, but you also rely on a kind of additional areas of agency where individuals can also actually provide their preferences and expectations on how the data is being used to serve them and to serve society as a whole. And so these are a set of principles uh, that um, can be used to then inform the processes that need to be in place to make decisions. And I think Malar was referring to all the kind of uh, ingredients uh, and the, the positions uh, that need to be in place, but you also need to have decision processes because by the end of the day, you need to make decisions on how you actually go go, go about uh, the purpose uh, that is aligned with the, the principles. And here, I think it's super important to also make sure that those processes are seen as legitimate and at the same time effective. And I think that's uh, another kind of element of the framework as well. So in some, uh, <laughs> Richie, uh, I think there are kind of five P's that one may want to uh, address, the purposes, the principles, in order to make decisions via processes that ultimately then need to be implemented 
through practices and then dedicated positions that can oversee whether those practices align with the decisions and the principles as well. Oh man, purposes, principles, something, practice, <laughs> processes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll go four out of five. I, I, I um, gave you a mnemonic to make it easy. Oh, yeah. Okay, but, uh, all right. Uh, Everyone has to watch the recording back and repeat that phrase over and over until they got all five Ps. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we're out of uh, time for my questions already. This has gone by so fast. Um, all right. We've got some great questions from the audience, though. So uh, let's uh, dive over to those. Now, the first question comes from Awanish saying, how do you balance the necessary data governance with agility and accessibility? Can we avoid creating processes that stifle innovation and make data difficult to use? All right. So, um, yeah, how do you keep yourself nimble and agile uh, while having good data governance? Who wants to go first on this? No takers. Is this an impossible question to answer? <laughs> um, I can maybe take a stab. Okay, go on. I think it's a very, very pertinent question. And I think that's a struggle for everyone to kind of balance what we say, how do you balance enablers, which is about enabling use while safeguarding and protecting information. Uh, but also you're looking at it more from, you know, let's not make it too compliance oriented that it's just so hard to, uh, you know, innovate based on that. I think it's a process in the sense that, um, I think it's, I, I just want to go back to what Esther said uh, you know, maybe I, I, I'll just connect Esther's point with what we did at the World Bank as well. Uh, you know, we wanted to show, I think you need to, you, you can do that by illustrating value. For example, at the World Bank, about five or six years ago, before we really uh, ramped up our data governance uh, initiative, a simple question would be, what, you know, as staff, if I joined the organization, uh, you know, what data I had access to. You know, I, you know, the, the way we would do that is someone would find data as they call someone and call someone, you know, there's a phone tag that you play. You don't know where to go. You don't know what data you had access to. You didn't know how you can access it. Uh, you don't know what are the terms under which you can, you can actually access that data. Uh, people were afraid to share information. Uh, you know, there's this famous phrase by Hans Rosling that everybody must have heard called the database hugging disorder. I think that was a serious disease for us at the bank, but I think we've Oh, I, I haven't, sorry, I haven't heard this phrase, database hugging disorder. Hugging disorder, yes. Uh, so it's 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 when you decide to hug your database and you don't want to release it or share it. Uh, <laughs> so so it's by, it's Hans Rosling. It's not, it's, I, I didn't coin the name. But but uh, again, going back to the, the point is that I think you want to show value. I mean, there are some things that organizations do, like the World Bank did as well. As the first step is we, we try uh, to understand what data we had. You know, and that manifests itself in different ways. Sometimes it's in the form of a data catalog, uh, where you then understand what are your high value data sets, and then you really focus on governing those, and you're able to show what kind of innovation and value that you, you could bring. Um, in some other cases, I will give you another example where these are real deliberations, right? You might get frustrated about why you're not able to use certain data, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just because of the nature of regulatory environment we are in, or we just don't have standards. So we just have to proactively start setting them up. In the case of COVID, for example, I think everybody saw that, how we really struggled to use information. Even high-income countries that had very strong data systems uh, really struggled to use information from, uh, you know, their health systems or, you know, from mobile phone operators because we didn't have a regulatory environment to access that information, or we didn't have technical standards that talk to each other. Uh, so you know, by focusing on them, I think, and bringing in change management is something then you, you know, we hope to reach that balance between that enablers and while protecting and having stringent processes that protect information. Absolutely. Um, so that COVID example where like you've got a ton of data, but actually making use of that data is very difficult. That seems like uh, a problem everywhere. It's like, okay, yeah, you're not actually having an impact unless you can make use of your data. Okay, so uh, next question comes from Lawrence. So Lawrence asks, how do you actually measure the quality of data? How do you know if your organization's data is good or bad? Um, so yeah, what what's the scoring system here? Um, uh, I can take that. Question. Sure. Um, Lawrence, I think what I can say is, is the approach that we've taken is, 
we, we look at data quality based on three categories. One is um, industry standards. So for example, when you have quality, when you might want to measure your data, for example, currency data, obviously there's industry standards around how currencies should look like, how they're named. There's the ISO um, standards. So we, look, we, we try and get um, industry standard type of um, um, rules into, into the way we measure our data. The second category is regulatory. So I, I think also I saw in the chat, somebody talked about GP, GDPR, there's POPIA in South Africa where, where I am. And it's basically taking those standards from a regulatory perspective and, and, and applying that to our data quality rules. Then the third one, which is the most important one, is the business context and the business rules. Um, is, are, is your data meeting the rules of your business uh, processes? Um, and then some of the ways we measure that is 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 really um, and the approach can be can vary. We've adopted the DMBOK Dharma DMBOK approach. We've taken the different um, data quality dimensions and we've tried to create rules around those different um, um, dimensions. And then the other thing that we, we we had to do is make sure that we workshopped with our business users and we also engaged with different. Uh, leaders from from different areas of the business, like um, Mala mentioned, um, legal um, compliance risk teams to kind of give us also a different perspective and lens to the data, because also what tends to happen is that when you look at it only from a business context and you ignore the other factors, for example, what is needed for financial. Um, a management and reporting what's needed from a risk management perspective, you miss out on some of those um, pertinent rules that you should be measuring. And obviously, it's uh, for us, it's also visualizing those those metrics and making sure that it's accessible to people. And one thing that really worked for us is even when we build reports, we add on a layer of, of having a data quality metric for that report. So you're measuring the data that's being used in that report so that the decision maker knows the level of quality of the data that's in that report in order to make decisions. So there's different approaches. We've just adopted the Dharma DMBOK approach. Oh man, um, I do like the idea of showing data quality in the dashboard so the person who's sort of downstream from you can see that. That's kind of terrifying though. <laughs> like, uh, if it you get is. a low score, there would be some funny questions asked like, why is this dashboard existing if uh, it's not very good quality? Um, all right, we are basically uh, at time. So before we finish, 10 seconds each on how do you do data governance better? So final advice, uh, Amy, uh, would you like to go first? Uh, I would just say start small, deliver value, drive awareness. And I liked the thing I saw in chat, use the um, business as your word of mouth ambassadors and it'll spread. I like that one a lot. Excellent, yeah, that's very cool. Uh, Mala, uh, what's your final advice? I mean, I really want to second what Amy said in terms of start small, and then you really become agile and improve. I do want to add three principles that we talk about when we talk about data governance, which is value, getting value out of data, look at it through a value lens of how you can unlock that value by reuse and use. And the second is uh, equity. Um, a lot of data that we use today is, is really used only for very special, you know, to the benefit of certain groups of people. So in, in how you deliver services using the data, I think it's really important to have the equity dimension that everyone benefits from the use of the data uh, that there is. Um, and the last is building trust. With all of the exposure to data that I'm sure you're all reading in the news about um, you know, data security issues, data breaches, I think it, it's really important to safeguard data and which will build further build trust in, in the data that we are producing along with being very transparent about how we are doing, how we are processing data and how we are using data and around the data quality dimensions. Good luck to All everyone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, good luck, you'll need it. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Stefan, um, what's your final advice? 
Yeah, well, meaning it's always hard to narrow it down. But um, uh, I would just pick up on something that Amy actually mentioned uh, earlier as well, is that it's super important to formulate the purpose uh, well, uh, which also includes formulating the questions well, for which you then need data. And then you also know to what extent does it need to be governed, to what extent can it be made equitable, to what extent can it actually be done in a trusted way. And so I would... As uh, some of uh, you might know, I've been advocating for actually question science to complement data science because we really need to do better in how we go about formulating questions because that's where it all starts. All right, wonderful. Yeah, I get better at uh, asking and answering questions. Um, Esther, uh, final final piece of advice from you. Um. I think everybody said great points. I think for me is also just start where you are. Um, assess your current state and maturity. I think it's important to know where you are, what the gaps are, what you, where your shortcomings are, what strengths you have already that's in your organization. It, it, it doesn't make sense starting a journey where you don't even know where you are in that journey. Um, so it's important to understand where you are and where what, what your readiness is, what your organizational readiness is and what risk tolerance you have in the organization. Oh, yes. Understanding your data maturity. Awesome. Very important. All right. We are well over time now and everyone needs to jump to the final session. So I will have to wrap up quickly. Uh, just thank you uh, to all four of our speakers. That was just magnificent stuff. Really, really informative. Uh, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. All right. And for everyone in the audience, please do jump to the final session. Uh, it's going to be a good one. All right. Bye.